All right, so we will start the webinars now. Uh, before that, like I just want to make sure you guys are able to see my slides and you're able to he hear me clearly. So in case if you're having any issues, please let me know. Uh, yep, yeah, I think I will get this going. So welcome to everyone for joining this webinar on effect of microstructure constituents on true body abrasive wear. Uh, so first, before getting into the webinar, there are a few instructions for you guys to just to understand just for the housekeeping thing. So, so go into the my settings and there are a few notifications for you to clear have a better experience of this webinar. I hope you're able to do this. Make sure you have unticked all these boxes onto your right. And today's technical topic is study on microstructure characteristics of steel in two body abrasive wear. Uh, so we have around nine to 10 participants for the day. So uh, before that, like I just want to know like uh, how many of you are from a, a metallurgical background for the day? Is anyone from a metallurgical background? Yep, that's one person. Okay, great. Nice. All right, so yeah, so th this topic is my, was part of my PhD uh, program in 2013. So the all the work that, I've, that I'll be showing you today was a major section of my PhD work. So what I've done is I've taken a major chunk of my PhD and I'm presenting it to you. So before to that, like uh, I am Balaji. Uh, I work as a, currently I'm working as an interdisciplinary lecturer at University of Sydney in Australia. So I've been in this job for the last three months. And prior to that, I was working in Deakin University. Uh, and then earlier, then I was working uh, with a startup company in Geelong in Australia in 3 in 3d printing of uh, aluminum heat exchanges for a few years and then i've also worked in uh, teaching in different tertiary institutions across australia new zealand and china so that's a very brief introduction about me uh, i come from a mechanical and materials background uh, and uh, yeah, so I finished my PhD in 2017 and post my PhD, I've been involved, uh, I've been working in a number of education in academic as well as uh, industries. All right. So some of the common questions you have, do I get a copy of the slides? Yes, you will get a copy of the slides. Who is attending the webinar? So via email, there'll be a PDF version of the slides. So make sure you check them after your after the webinar is over. And you will also get a copy of your attendance. So there'll be a QR code at the end of it. So which you need to complete it before which you will be, uh, which will actually prove your attendance for this webinar. So once you've done it, you will get a digital certificate saying that you have attended this session. Okay. So what we will do, these are some of the questions. I'm sure there are people to help you with uh all these slides and information but ha having said that in case if we have any questions or after the press after the webinar or the presentation you can always contact me i will try to uh type in my email address for you guys to contact me uh in case if you have any questions or if there are any other things that you want to talk about okay all right so now we have about eit so EIT, as you might have known, it's uh, one of those institutes in the world which specializes in engineering courses, di diplomas, and different education levels in terms of undergraduate, graduate, bachelor's, and master's. And there are several industry-oriented programs which are largely delivered, delivered by uh, specialized people with, with voluminous experience in industries as well as academic orientations. Okay. So this is just a brief introduction about me. Uh, probably I don't want to talk about much about, like probably we'll get to the webinar soon, which you can find it online. So, All 
Great. So before going into this, so today's topic is about our two body abrasive wear in microstructures. So what we want to see is I want to start from a very basic level of introduction, starting with tribology and then building up slowly. So what does tribology mean? Tribology actually is a combination of the study of wear behavior in surfaces. Okay, so tribology actually covers a large group of wear and this is the interaction between the two surfaces. So when two surfaces starts to interact, there are multiple uh, mechanisms and studies that are involved. So for instance, you start to analyze the wear, which is nothing but the loss of material. When two materials starts to uh, rub against each other, you have friction to study, there's contact mechanics, then the material science of it, what are the surface treatment that is being done, the corrosion aspect. So when you're talking about tribology, it encompasses all these different studies into it. So tribology is, a, is quite a complex uh, study as such, but however, what we would be doing is we'll be taking only a part of it, which is be the wear behavior. Wear is nothing but when two surfaces start to interact, or I would say touch each other over a period of time, you will see a loss of material. So this is exactly what we call wear. So wear is a very common mechanism. You will find it in almost every material on this planet Earth. You will find wear in your teeth. You will find wear in your clothes. You'll find wear in your footwear. Every, every possible entity in this world undergoes wear. Wear is a very common phenomena which you cannot stop. All you could do is minimize wear. So today's webinar is, is all about not just studying wear, but just one specific type of wear. So in terms of wear, there are multiple types of wear. For example, two body abrasive wear, this is an abrasive wear, adhesive wear, uh, and other, other types of fretting wear and things like this. So our focus is just to understand about, to, about abrasive wear, okay? So meanwhile, uh, I, as I go through, in case if you have any questions, please text me in the chat box. I will try to, uh, I mean, I will answer every now and then in case if it needs to be held up a little, I will hold, I will try to explain that particular question at the very end, okay? So today is about the different modes of wear. So there, as I told you, there are multiple, there are five major types of wear. One is in adhesive wear, second is an abrasive, fatigue wear, tribochemical or corrosive wear or fretting wear and fretting wear. All right. So my topic is all about abrasive wear. Okay. So the reason why I picked abrasive wear is because it's one of the most significant forms of wear across all the five types. The reason why I say is it contributes almost 50% of wear in most industry applications, especially mining and mineral processing industries. Okay, the, the other reason is uh, Australia, uh, one of the major uh, industries is mining industries and mineral processing. So abrasive wear plays a huge role uh, in, in all these machineries and equipment. So abrasive wear, that's why one of the main reasons why a PhD project was focused on abrasive wear. Okay, so abrasive wear is nothing about when a hard particle abrades against a soft particle. So the process of material removal when a hard surface slides against a soft surface. So this picture over here will give you a good understanding what happens. It's in a hard particle abrades against a soft particle, you will see material being removed here. All right. You will see the material being removed here. So that's why. So th this abrasive wear is quite significant. You will see uh, in every part of it. So if you want to understand in a very simple way, uh, think about a cheese grating process or when you try to grate a carrot or a vegetable using a grater. So you will have a cheese which is just being grated against a hard metal surface. You will see the cheese coming down in terms of sprinklers. So when you try to grate on top of a pizza or a whatever or lasagna, you will see this happening. So this is exactly what I say abrasive wear. So here the cheese is a soft substance whereas the grater is the hard substance. Okay, so that's abrasive wear. So in abrasive wear, there are different types, which we'll come back soon. So this is a very important stat that I want to 
uh, reiterate again why I think Brazil is huge. So U.S. approximately spends $500 billion due to inadequate control of friction wear. So that's not in one year, that's in a couple of every year they spend so much money. So almost at one third of the world's resources are utilized in overcoming friction and wear. So, so in this picture, you will see a bucket wheel excavator. So what it does is once the, you see this is a big bucket excavator, which is almost like 60, 70 feet high. So when it or like a, which in roughly say like uh, 200 meters high. So what happens is once it goes, it starts to move in this circular fashion. So what it does is this buckets will start to go into these gravels and starts to pick material. So over a period of time, this is an abrasive action in place. What happens is the bucket excavator starts to lose material. And after a point, the kit loses its complete functionality. So initially when it starts to lose material, um, it's not affecting much, but over a period of time, when the material loss is consistent and it's happening continually, after some time, you will find the bucket losing its functionality. So this is an abrasive wear in action. So you have a hard material abrading against a softer steel. Okay. So my aim, my study was, uh, it was not trying to stop wear, but it was more trying to understand wear. So because uh, some of the common steels that we used in these kind of abrasive action resistant material are some of the steels I've mentioned here, something called as quenched and sparadized steels, quenched and tempered steels, dual phase steels, and trip steels. So these are some of the very common steels that we use in uh, these uh, areas where we want to resist or reduce abrasive wear. So for people who are less familiar, so these are uh, quenched, sparadized, these are different types of heat treatment. Okay, so what happens is, so quenched is nothing but you heat the steel to a very austenizing temperature, which could, and then they, they immediately quenched in water or oil or salt water. That's called quenching and sparadization. So sparadization is a process in which you try to uh, form carbide structures within these steels. If you see closely, you will find small circular rounds. These are called as spalarized structures. These are nothing but cementite particles. We call them as FECC, iron carbide. Okay, so you make them into form of spalarides. When you have these spalarides, they impart a lot of uh, fracture toughness to the steel. All right, so in case of tempered, we do something similar. So in tempered, you will have carbides in the middle. You will see white regions in the middle. We call carbides and the surrounding areas are ferrite. These are ferrite, carbides. These are all different phases in a steel. So dual phase steel is something very common. People, a lot of people use in cars, bodies, dual phase steels and trip steels. Trip steel is nothing but it's called transformation induced plasticity steel. So all these steels, what you see common is there's not one single phase, but you have multiple phases within these steels. Okay, so my my understanding or my question was, what are the what are the role of these individual phases and how do they work? So we largely call them as multi-phase microstructures because there's more than one phase involved in these steels. So we want to see how these individual phases start to react when they are put to abrasive behavior. So I want to understand what's the role of a ferrite, what would be the role of a carbide or a bainite or martensite. So to understand this, what I decided to do is, I decided to take uh, sim single phase microstructures and multi-phase microstructures. Because if I want to understand what is the role of individual phases, then I need to uh, segregate them separately and play them together. So that was my aim. So what I did, so I, I had a couple of objectives in place, okay? The first one was, what is the role of ferrous microstructures with similar hardness on abrasive wear behavior? So my initial aim is to have single phase and multi-phase microstructures, but all with the same hardness level. So for people always ask me, like, uh, it's a very, very challenging task, like to have microstructures with same hardness. So when you look at these, uh, that's all right, John, but that's okay. You didn't much miss mass. You can just start. That's fine. 
So if you look at these steels, these have different mark faces, but their hardness will be very, very different. Uh, so what happens is when you want to resist abrasion, hardness is a very important factor. So when you have high hardness steels, they always try to resist abrasion well. But having said that, there are steels with low hardness, but still have better abrasion resistance than steels with high hardness. So we also want to understand what is the role of hardness in this. So what we decided to do, the first objective, we picked up four microstructures with all similar hardness levels to see how these microstructural constituents are playing differently. So what we did, we took bainite, tempered martensite, martensite, and perlite, and we decided to understand how these microstructures would play because we didn't take anything challenging. We want to start with simple microstructures and understand their behavior. And then once we did that study, then we decided to do what was the best microstructure in these four. From that microstructure, we decided to change the individual constituents to play how they are going. For example, if the bainite was really good, then we changed the size of the bainite. For example, the bainitic ferrite, retain austenite, we played with the individual constituents within bainite to see how they are affecting their abrasive behavior. And finally, what we did, we used the same four microstructures to understand better about abrasive wear in a very contra controlled environment. This was a very specialized uh, wear behaving uh, wear equipment which we designed in-house and we also did a test using this. So these are the three major studies we'll be looking upon today. All right, so let's go into the first objective. Yeah, so this is the laboratory equipment which we started doing the first two tests, first two objectives. This is called as a tribometer, tribometer which you, some of you or most of you might have seen it. So it's a CSM tribometer. So what it does is it has a leveling arm, it has a normal load. So you can change the load uh, depending upon your wish, upon your design of experiments. So you can go up to 5, 10, 20 Newton loads. Here you can, you can see the pin. So I've just zoomed the space over here. So this pin is the actual microstructure. So what happens is this pin is stationary while there's the wheel beneath is rotating. So this will uh, rotate in a circular fashion, whereas the material will start to uh, abrade against these hard abrasive particles. So this is nothing but your abrasive uh, paper in different grid size. This is a silicon carbide and comes in alumina as well, but I've used silicon carbide for this particular study. Uh, it comes in different particle sizes. I have kept the particle size constant for all the tests, and then I have kept the speed constant for all the tests and the sliding distance. All right. Okay, so in terms of uh, first things is what are the things that really affect abrasive wear? The first thing is the material, metallurgical factors. The two important things, one is the microstructure and the hardness. So hardness is nothing but the bulk hardness of the material. The second is the abrasive particles. What are the size of the particles? What are the fracture toughness and hardness? And third is the environment. So what, what is the temperature, humidity and these things? So this is the least contributing factor in terms of abrasive wear, the C, whereas B contributes to some extent, 20 to 30 percentage, whereas the major section is this, the material. So we will start from A, B, and C, we will not focus, but A and B. So in terms of A, microstructure and hardness. So we know both affects abrasive wear. So what we did for the first objectives, we kept the hardness and we changed the microstructure. So we kept the hardness as constant, and we change our microstructures to understand how different microstructures will affect abrasive wear. Okay, so in this uh, slide, you can see that we chose three different steels. Okay, so it's going to be a very, very challenging task to produce all the four microstructures in one steel. It takes a lot of time. So what we decided to do is we have chosen three different steels. Of course, a chemical composition is different. We had to do this because we want to have, we want to make four microstructures with similar hardness levels. 
All right. So people will argue, what about the role of carbon percentage and carbon of chromium and things? Of course, it plays a role in their abrasive behavior, but we have tried to focus only keeping the hardness was the main uh, idea about it. My idea was to keep the hardness constant and produce four microstructures and to put them to two body abrasive wear and see how they all are responding. So what we did was we did four different heat treatments, so three different heat treatments. Steel C, we got it in perlite condition, whereas A and B, we did a couple of heat treatments to produce these microstructures. Okay, give me a moment. So for the steel A, what we did, we did an austenizing as I told you, and then austempering to produce bainite. And for the same steel we did, we water quenched and we got it, and then we tempered. We got tempered martensite and steel B was austenized and rapid water quenched to produce martensite. Okay, so these are the uh, schematic representations of perlite, bainite, martensite, and tempered martensite. All right, so here you have carbides in within these uh, ferritic structures. Here you have uh, ferritic uh, martensitic lats. And then bainite, you have this yellow region is the ferritic lath and the gray region is the retained austenite. And this is a very typical perlite structures. So what we are going to do, we will subject them to uh, uh, two body abrasive wear. And then we will do uh, quite a few post wear characterization. What does post wear characterization means? After completing the wear test, we will take the material. We will see the bottom surface of it, how it has worn out. We will understand those surfaces to see how material has been removed and the subsurface, which we call the worn out surface, the surface beneath the worn out area in microscope. So we will see all these areas. Okay, so these are the four microstructures I've told you. So those were schematics and these were the ACM images of them. This is a bainite, this is a perlite, martensite and tempered martensite. So if you have a look at the hardness, they are within this 320 to 360 mark. So we have almost got similar hardness. So after doing a wear test, what we realized, so even though they are very similar hardness levels, perlite had the best wear resistance. So if you look, so when the graph is higher, it means there's more material is being lost in martensite and tempered martensite. Whereas perlite and bainite, the wear rate is very less comparatively, which is meaning to say that they have better wear resistance than martensite and tempered martensite, despite they all having similar hardness. For instance, if we take bainite, martensite and tempered martensite, they all have 360 mark, but however, look at the wear rates, it's almost half of martensite and tempered martensite, which was very interesting. So if you have similar hardness, you should roughly have similar wear rate, but not the case. So this clearly tells you that microstructure constituents are influencing the wear rate of these uh, microstructures. Even the frictional curve, if we have a look, tempered martensite, bainite, perlite had the most little coefficient of friction. So coefficient of friction is nothing but, so when two surfaces starts to rub, we will see how the friction starts to change, okay? So you see perlite will having the black one will having the most uh, consistent friction, whereas tempered martensite, it starts to increase uh, ma blue martensite, bainite and things. So perlite, despite having been 326 because hardness, they continue to produce a less wear rate as well as best coefficient of friction. friction. So what we did, we did a topographic analysis of the abraded surface. So what does it mean? So after material is worn out, so which means we go back. So we will look into the surface here. We will directly look here. So for instance, probably I can draw here. Okay. For instance, we look at down. So if this is the pin, so what I would do, I would directly look at this surface in the under the microscope. So this will be looking at round structure with all the lines like this, worn out lines. 
So this is what I'll be looking under the microscope. So when I look at this structure on the microscope, so this is what I'll be seeing. Okay. So when you look into this, so you will see a height scale given here. So which gives you the good indication of how it looks like. So when you have a look, bainite perlite, the, you, the grooves were very uniform, very sharp, whereas martensite and tempered martensite, if you look, they were wide and shallow grooves. So what does it mean? So here, the grooves were deep and narrow, which means the material loss very, very less. So for instance, the grooves I will show you later. So the grooves were more like, like this. So if this is the surface, it they were like deep and narrow. Whereas for bainite and so for the martensite and tempered martensite, the grooves were wide and shallow like this. So what is happening is you have a larger material loss as opposed to here. Okay. So this is why this has got a bigger material loss. That's why martensite and tempered martensite. So I will show you some of the surface profilometer. So this was done through in using a topographic analysis. And this is done through the same analysis. We calculated the surface roughness. You will see the grooves were really, really wide here, whereas these are very narrow. For instance, we have a look at these in terms of scale bar. So you're looking at here, this is the average ones. This is the average deep, which is four. Whereas here, when you look at the at depth, it's very, very small. It's, it's almost like four microns, four, four to five microns. Here, it was just like two microns. They were wide. Okay, so this is why we say wide grooves. So what we did, we analyzed those single character, single and multi tracks. And what we realized is one of the most important thing is how the material is being lost. So there are two mechanisms, a couple of mechanisms. We one we call them as plowing. So if we have a look, this is called as plowing. So when the plowing, what happens is the material will get displaced to the sides. So in reality, the material is not being lost, but they are being displaced to the sides in bainite and perlite. But as martensite and uh, tempered martensite, what is happening is we call them as cutting. So cutting, what happens is the material, can you see here? So here, if you see, once the material gets abraded like this, it gets displaced and lost as debris. This is called as cutting mode, whereas here is called plowing. So what happens in plowing and wedging is the material will get displaced to the sides or onto the edges. Okay, so that's just what we call. So here, if you see the material is getting displaced to the sides, even see if you see, you will see the material getting displaced to the sides. So the, the material is not being lost. They are still in the microstructure. Whereas martensite and tempered martensite, they are lost and there's very little material attached to the sides. Okay. So this was a major material removal mechanism in Martin in these microstructures. So if you have a look, so what we did, once we analyzed the top surface of the steel, now what we did, we went and analyzed this. For example, if this is the, the pin that was abrading on the surface, first what we did was we analyzed this section. First, we saw the bottom surface. Now, what we did was we analyzed this surface. So, we what we did was uh, we had to take, we had to upgrade, we had to micro polish it and do an ACM surface. And we looked into this surface. So, if you look clearly, what happens is probably I'll zoom it like this. So, this is the actual mic surface, and this is the worn out region. So this is the normal core microstructure. This is the surface. 
So this is the surface and this is the uh, microstructure. So once the material gets abraded, so this is what the abrasive action happens. So once this happens, you will see the microstructures are realigning towards this abrasive actions. I don't know what I did. So what is happening is when you look here, so as the ab abrasive action happens in from left to right, the material starts to abrade and realign its constituents that particular direction. If you see, I've zoomed this direction. So this is expanded to really, really high magnification, which is around 200 nanometers. So if you see how these, these sections have been realigned, even in perlite, they have realigned. But whereas in martensite and tempered martensite, the realignment is, it is there in tempered martensite, but martensite you do not see. The reason is, bainite has a higher fracture toughness, whereas martensite does not have the fracture toughness as like bainite. So if you look in the microstructure point of view, so bainite will have retained austenite and ferrite. So retained austenite is responsible for all the fracture toughness. Similarly, in perlite, you have ferrite and cementite. So ferrite is the uh, structure that gives the toughness. In martensite, there's nothing that can give strength to the structure. It is largely a very brittle structure. So that what happens is when there's an abrasive wear, they start to lose material very quickly. Similarly, in tempered martensite, there are some carbides, but they are not very useful. Okay, so, so what I've done, I've put a small schematics to understand. So when a particle abrades against, on the top you find single phase microstructures, like martensite, tempered martensite, in the bottom you have multi-phase microstructures, like, like tempered, like sorry, the bainite and perlite. So when there's a single phase with diff no different constituents, the particle can easily penetrate. That's why you have wide crack and more material loss. Whereas in brittle phase, what happens is you have a combination of brittle phase and ductile phase, brittle phase, ductile phase. So this can be either like this or in other ways. For example, either this can be like alternative or this could be like spherical structures like this, like in case of bainite, or it can be something like perlite, where you have alternate structures like this. Okay, so if we had the dark region would be the brittle phase, and the white region would be the ductile phase. So when you have a combination structure of brittle and ductile phase, it's better. So that's why brittle phase, the uh, multi-phase microstructures have better abrasive wear resistance. When you look, the work hardening. So work hardening is nothing but calculating the hardness before and after the wear test. So in the actual worn out surface, we will do a wear hardness test and see how the hardness has increased. So before the hard, before the test, you will see they're all in the similar ranges, the dark, the black color. But after the test, can you see bainite, the hardness increased almost up to 500 wickers, similarly perlite. But martensite and per, tempered martensite, there's no hardening at all. So this work hardening is very, very important in terms of resisting abrasive wear. So this work hardening will happen only due to the ductile phase present in bainite and perlite. So the ductile phase present in bainite is retained austenite, whereas the ductile phase present in perlite is ferrite. So these phase will undergo work hardening to improve the hardness. So because of this, the abrasion resistance is really, really good. So in the first objective, what we have found out was multi-phase microstructures, especially bainite and perlite, when they have a ductile phase present in them, they will be really good. Okay, for instance, that's why I say bainite, because of the retained austenite, They have a very good work hardening. And similarly, in perlite, the ferrite structures are responsible for the work hardening. So this is what I've been keep telling. So this is responsible for the work hardening effect.
okay so the subsurface sunlight we saw those white layer formations and different mainly the material removal how plowing and wedging is happening and cutting mode is happening okay so that was the end of the first objective so now what we will do is so now we realized is bainite is really really good so of course we could have taken perlite but perlite this uh, controlling those ferrite and uh, cementite particles was very very challenging so what we did we did was we took the bainite microstructure so if you look at the bainite so it will have like a bainitic ferrite and retained austenite with them probably i'll show you the micrographs if that will be more easy so when you look uh, so this is the bainite microstructure so if you have a look the white regions probably i'll zoom it a bit so these are the ferrite particles okay so the white gray color regions are the ferrite bainitic ferrite whereas these darker regions are the retained austenite so for example this will be your retained austenite So whereas this is going to be your bainitic ferrite. So what we are going to do, we chose this microstructure because we can change the size of it. So now our plan is to take this bainite and make different forms, different uh, use bainite in different structures. For example, we took the bainite and we changed the size of retained austenite and uh, bainitic ferrite to see how the size can change. So if we have a look, can you see? So we took one particular steel and then we produced four different bionic structures. So if you see 200, 250, 300, 350. So these are the austempering transformation temperatures. So from lower to higher. So with lower temperatures, when you transform, you will see there is more uh, retained austenite and less bionic ferrite. As you go higher and higher, the bionic ferrite will grow more and then the retained austenite will be very little. So we are trying to uh, control the volume fraction of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite by transformation temperatures. So what, what do we achieve? Why do we do this? So we want to see how with the same bainite, we can improve the valve resistance by controlling these microstructure constituents. So what we studied from the earlier study is the microstructure constituents are very important in determining the abrasive wear. So now we are going to work on the microstructure constituents. How individual uh, constituents within these microstructures, for example, in bainite, bainitic ferrite and retained austenite, when you change the volume fraction, size, shape, how they will affect the abrasive wear. So we, we made these four microstructures. Of course, they will have different hardness. We can't have the same hardness now because we have changed the microstructure constituents. Now we are going to see how they will affect abrasive wear. So we did the same set of studies again. And as you can see, once we did the same set of wear studies, we saw that the transformation temperature with the highest, which had the biggest amount of bainitic ferrite and smaller. So these were the microstructures. So when you look, it's, it's, it can be a bit challenging to understand how these microstructures look like. For example, the with the lowest or the highest bainitic transformation had the lowest hardness whereas the lowest transformation dimension will have the highest hardness because bainitic ferrite will be very, very thin and the stable and stability of these ferrite is very, very strong. And also the retained austenite. If we have a look, look at the thickness of bainitic ferrite here. So if the thickness is high, the hardness will be low, whereas when the thickness is thin and then the dislocation density will get to increase. Okay, so dislocation, when, they, when there are more dislocation density, it's a highly stressed material and you will have a very high hardness. And also you see the volume fraction of retained austenite decreasing. Okay, and also the shape of them will also change. So for higher transformation, you have very block chunky ones, whereas for low transformation, you will have very filmy ones, thin ones, retained austenite. So this is what we saw because of the high transformation, the bainitic ferrite is more, but they are less, have this dislocations. So the abrasive wear is more and more. Whereas as you go down to the transformation temperature, 
the dislocation density is high and also the, the retained austenite is very, very stable. So what happens in benthic ferrite during wear behavior? So for example, when you look here during the test, probably I'll show you a picture of what happened. Probably I'll draw and show you. So what happens is, let's say you have, this is a bainite microstructure. So you have, in this microstructure, you have bainitic ferrite and then you have retained austenite. So let's say the blue part is the bainitic ferrite and the red part is the retained austenite. So what happens is after wear, once you go to wear, once you do, once you wear this microstructure, once wear happens, so this microstructure will become, so all the retained austenite will change into martensite. So this behavior is called trip behavior. So the same microstructure after this wear, you will see that the bainitic ferrite will still remain the same, whereas the retained austenite will have changed into martensite. So this is your martensite. This is another phase transformation. So what is happening is the retained austenite is changing into martensite. So the red regions are called as the retained austenite just for understanding purpose. But after where they become into martensite. So this behavior transformation of retained austenite into martensite is called as trip behavior. So this behavior is called trip behavior. It's called transformation induced plasticity. Okay, because of transformation induced plasticity. So, so this retained austenite is a very ductile phase. When you do abrasion, they will become into a martensitic structure. So what happens is during this aware behavior, even there are more retained austenite, there will be more martensite. Okay. It also depends of how strong the retained austenite. We want the retained austenite to transform, but very, very slowly. If it happens quickly, what, what's the issue is martensite is a very hard phase, which we have seen a little earlier. It's a very brittle phase and there's more material loss. This is exactly is happening in, in this uh, magnetic microstructure at high transformation temperatures. So here, if you see there are 54 percentage of retained austenite. When there's more retained austenite, the problem is all the retained austenite will have changed into martensite and the material loss is very, very high. So as a result, the problem is they will start to have more material loss and the blocky retained austenite is very unstable. They will transform very quickly. Whereas at low transformation temperatures, there is very little retained austenite, which is, which is not great, but the good thing is they are very stable because of low transformation. The stability of retained austenite is very strong so that they will not transform into martensite very quickly. So it's a very catch 22 situation. You need martens retained austenite, but you need them in the form of film structure, not in terms of blocky structures. Okay. So we need an optimum level. Sorry. So if you have a look once again, at the higher transformation temperatures, you will have more material loss. They have a wider grooves. At low transformation temperatures, you have deeper narrow grooves, which we like what we saw earlier. So these are just a repetition of what we did last, the similar studies we did. So once again, we analyze a single and uh, single wire track. If you see at higher transformation temperature, material is being lost very quickly. So this is what you can see at higher transformations, the track tracks is wide. So material loss is more happening. Whereas when you have a look at the lower transformation, so when there's a braiding, the material is getting displaced to the sides here, here. So the material is not actually lost, but it's still staying in the material. Okay, this we called as the plowing and wedging mechanism, but it's called as cutting. Okay, so once again, when you did a subsurface analysis, these are really nice images where you can see those. At 350, you see they are realigned. If you see they are realigned here. Okay, 
but as you go down you will see the realignment really really strong can you see because they have this a high stability they are having a high abrasion resistance and they are able to tackle up more than more strain the the thinner the vita and osnite film me once and they have high questions is, is someone with a question here okay let me know if you have any questions okay i just saw someone raising a hand that's why i'm asking so if you no okay good so if you see here you have a highly deformed white layer this is something very common in a braided surface we call a white etching layer or the white layer so this indicates a very high strain that is these surfaces are able to tackle so what is happening is because of the high material loss the material is getting abraded so you're not seeing any white layer they are able to take up strain only to a small extent after that the material is abraded they're lost whereas in 250 and 200 conditions what is happening is they are able to take up more than more strain so you have a white layer forming up very very quickly the thickness is very very strong okay so that's why we say that when the vta nostrate in film structure they are very beneficial in wear resistance because more strain is required for trip effect trip effect is nothing but the transformation induced plasticity all right so once again we did the work hardening see how the work hardening has done if you look because these retain nos night the lower transformations the work hardening is not as much as you see in the work hardening here so in 350 the retain nos it is very blocky so that the work hardening happens very high but here the work hardening does happen but they are not as much to the sort of the blocky retain nos night so what we realized is work hardening is crucial all right but we can't have too much work hardening so when there's too much work hardening happening it can be detrimental so there is an optimum level that we need to balance out to have a better wear resistance okay and also we what we did was we tried to measure the retain nos night before and after wear test okay so when we did what we realized was retain nos night transformation was very very minimal whereas in the higher transformation temperatures more retain nos night were transformed into martensite so this is what we understood so when we change the morphology of your microstructure constituents in a fully bentic structure you can get a different abrasive wear behavior so for instance the major factor determining the wear behavior was retain nos night so if we change the retain nos night morphology and the carbon stabilities you can really produce good abrasive wear resistance okay on the final section is so this is a section that i was was also a part of the phd but i don't but i'm not showing it today because of the need of time so what we did in these two first two the problem with these abrasive tests was after a point the particles efficiency will start to really wear out okay so what happens is i will show you the next slide so we analyze couple of particles so a b c a b c all right so this is an silicon carbide on the left on the right you will see alumina the what's the issue is when you start the test the particles are nice but as the test progresses if you see let's say at this point you have the highest wear rate you will see at first 60 60000 millimeter distance sliding distance you will have the efficiency of the particle really good but as you the sliding distance goes to after a point it immediately drops so what is happening is the particle tends to lose its abrading efficiency very quickly so as a result you are not having a constant efficient particles interacting with the material throughout the wear test so we need to keep this particle constant to understand better so this test was that was one of the efficient disadvantages of these particle tests in a real industry environment the particles are always new so you'll always have fresh particles coming and attacking the bucket excavator or the machinery there the particles won't get damaged very quickly so once they are always digging into fresh particles every time they dig into there'll be new set of particles rocks attacking these 
bucket excavators. So what we need to do, we have to figure out uh, a much more diff uh, equipment that will be has a more control over this abrasive environment. So what we did, we made an in-house abrasive single point intender test. So this is like a tungsten carbide intender, which will move against uh, the abrasive the material. Okay. So for example, can you see here? Uh, hi, Mary. So if you see, this is the surface plate steel structure. This is, we are going to do the test, the bottom one. And this is the particle. So here there's no, we don't have to worry that the particle is going to change shape because it's a tungsten carbide. This is constant. There's no change in shape. We have a normal load happening at the top and this will move in this particular direction and it will start to abrade this material. So what we are doing is in reality direction and it will start to abrade this material. So what we are doing is in reality, we are producing one single scratch here like this and we will analyze them. This will have a better control over the abrasive environment. So we did a couple of loads, sliding speed was very slow and see a distance of 30 millimeters. Okay, so what we did initially, we went back to the very first four microstructures and we decided to do the same test and see how they are responding. So here, the hardness is constant. Only thing is the microstructure constituents, but more importantly, we have a better control over the environment. So probably I might rush through the slides just to give you understanding and then I will open it for questions. So if you have a look, bainite, you have bottom we have this uh, bainite and perlite where we have clean grooves whereas tempered martensite and martensite if you look the this the after this is the wet test for example if we have a look so we did this is if this is the plate one single plate we did a one big intenda we did a groove or a wire track and then we started to examine them Okay, so we started to examine this particular surface in an SEM. Okay, so once we start to examine, so this is what it looks like. All right, so you can see that the material is very delaminating and the, the, the loss is very, very high. Okay. So what we did, we did a analysis using topography. If you see as we increase in load, the grooves are getting wider and wider. You have a step formation in this martin site and tempered martin site. They had very similar structures. These were, whereas in bainite, you will see slightly different. At only at very high loads, you will see this step formation happening. Even at thousand load, thousand newton, there was step formation in martin site and tempered martin site. Whereas here, there's no step formation at all. Only at very high loads, this was happening. So what it tells is bainite and perlite, they're good at low loads, but as you go with higher loads, they're not able to take as much as they want. Okay. So what we did, we analyzed this, this is the groove, the material being edged, displaced to the sides. So the couple of things we really went into an in-depth analysis, we calculated the degree of penetration, volume of material loss and everything. So this is a very interesting material removal mechanism. If you remember by now, you should have a good slight understanding about plowing and wedging and cutting. So what happens is in plowing and wedging, the material gets displaced to the sides. So the material is not effectively lost. So if you have a look, bainite and perlite. So for so this is a mathematical calculation. So what happens is when F is close to zero value, which means plowing takes place. When F is close to one, the more close to one cutting takes place. So if you see Martin site, tempered Martin site, you will have more of this happening even at very low loads. You have more cutting mechanism happening at all the loads, whereas bainite and perlite. So this will happen only in terms of low loads. At low loads, you have plowing mechanism, whereas at high loads, you have cutting mechanism. So the material removal is only higher for bainite and perlite at very high loads, whereas martensite and tempered martensite, they had a constant cutting mechanism all through the loads.
okay so even this is a group profile analysis we decide how the volume of material loss is happening if you see martin side had the highest material loss degree of penetration and similarly okay so degree of this is a very interesting method so for the same degree of penetration we had different material loss in the tempered martin side okay So and we also analyze the subsurface characteristics with Martin site and tempered Martin site. There was a lot of voids that were happening due to uh, the detachment factors at higher because the Martin site being a very um, brittle structures at higher loads, the strain is very high. As a result, the material the, the material starts to delaminate and voids happen very very quickly, and then they start to come out like layers of material whereas in terms of bainite and perlite what is happening is something very interesting bainite they are able to take up very high strain that's why you will see all these white formation layers and then they starts to delaminate whereas in perlite they starts to coagulate the ferrite and cementite they become into a round mass so we did a tem analysis which is really nice so if you see these regions so here you have this martensitic glass and here you have perlite regions so normally perlite is a very cabbage structure but after this what do you call this uh, high uh, high strain test they all become coagulated cementite dissolution and highly dislocated so they become really round formations so this is a subsurface layer thickness for different loads the subsurface really gets to thicken and thicken if you see tempered martin side where they have very high thickness and the hardness if you see bainite and perlite had the highest hardness which once again tells you there's a work hardening happening in these two microstructures that is really really beneficial for their low wear rate so bainite and perlite had work hardening mechanisms which was responsible for the superior hardness uh, abrasive resistance This is a compared to group profile, which can be a bit challenging right now because we don't have time. We will talk another time. So what we realized is we have come to the very end of the session. So in multi-phase microstructures, the volume of material removal is low, which means bainite and perlite had better abrasion resistance, but they were largely for lower loads. At higher loads, their abrasion resistance starts to dip, which is normal because there's a more higher load than the material can actually take. So the most important thing is work hardening is very, very important in all these microstructures. When there's work hardening happening, they will have a better wear resistance. Okay, so these were the four publications that were made using this study. I'm also currently working on other research projects at this point uh, with magnetic steels and things. So in case people are interested, you can always contact me. So probably now I will open for questions. So these are the upcoming courses. They have it at EIT. Uh, oh, thank you, Vincent. So what we will do is so this is upcoming uh, events and webinars. So probably there's a QR code. So if, for, if, if you want to get your QR code, you can always, you need to scan your QR code and there's a, you have to form, you have to fill it over there. All right, once you do it, you'll be able to get your digital certificate. Okay, so probably I'll open it for questions now. So if you have any questions, please let me know. And also what I will do, I'll send my contact details. Thank you. Uh, In case if you want to contact me for any uh, consultation or in terms of your research ideas or anything, please do. Uh, I always work with different set of people and I supervise students for uh, for PhD and things. So in case if you have anything, please let me know. Thank you. Yep, how, uh, thinking that Martin microstructure is harder than B, absolutely. How come somebody had a wider vasca with lesser penetration depth than 
Okay. So Benedict microservice definitely has a harder microservice agree. No, uh, for example, if you, so that's what I said, like hardness is not the only reason that it will affect the microstructures. Okay. So for example, in terms of Bainite and Martensite, Martensite has very strong uh, lats, Martensitic lats, which has a very high amount of dislocations. Okay, so when you put them to test, what happens is they're very brittle and they will start to uh, crumble easily and there's a higher material loss. That's why we have wide bass car. But on the other hand, the bainite, the, the advantage is they have this, this retained austenite structures. If we have a look. Okay, so if you, what was the microstructure that I wanted to show you? So I think this is what you're talking about, I guess. So if you have a look, the volume of material loss in Martin side versus Bainite. Bainite is the green one. So what is happening is the loads that they can take, the retained austenite will be very helpful in transforming into Martin side. So with Martin side, there's no transformation happening. You already start with a Martin stick microstructure. So when you put them in into where, the material is losing very quickly. That's why you have wide bass car. Whereas in Bainard, you have retained austenite, which will transform little later, but eventually it will take more time to wear out. Okay, so the penetration depth is also something interesting because penetration depth, what is happening is, uh, the penetration depth is called calculated by a very interesting formula, which is called 2D by width, which is the depth and the width. Okay, so for the same penetration depth, this is a mathematical ratio, remember, not a mere single value. So for example, if we have a wider width with a smaller depth, then you will have a very small degree of penetration, which means you have a wide scar, but the depth is very, very small. So you, you have to be a little careful in how you interpret the degree of penetration. I hope I answered yes plus. All right, so if you do not have any more questions, probably I will stop. Uh, we, I think we are already end of time, it's 9.31. And thank you everyone for coming on to this session. Uh, in case if you have more questions, Silas, Hango, please email me. I'm, I'm quite happy to give you a very detailed explanation. And it was all nice meeting you, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Bye.